Hello. My name is uh, Dr. Alex Tang. I'm also a pediatrician in Johor Specialist Hospital, where I am uh, also a, a, a professor, in, as a professor in your school. And this, I want to share a lecture with you. Okay, so just uh, hear what I say and uh, just take notes of all the important points because I'm not going to cover everything. Okay, if you want to download this lecture and other lectures of mine, you go to my website www.alexstang.org. Yeah. So here we go. In this lecture, we'll talk about an overview of the immunization schedule, the basis of immunization, infection, concerns of parents, and the cold chain, and a few other things that I want to highlight to you. We have to realize that the main problem with the world today and the issue that is facing are the deaths of children that are younger than five years, which is a concern in the WHO and in the world today. You can see that neonatal problems accounts for 37% in 2005. Then you see diarrhea, measles, malaria, pneumonia. And this is all infective disease. Looking at the cause of neonatal death, you find that pre prematurity is about 28%, third, about one third, asphyxia, 23%, and then the rest are all sexes. So you find that infection is a major cause of death in children under five years old. Now this is a 2013, okay, a number of years later, and you see that Look at the neonatal chart. Okay. Pneumonia, sepsis, tetanus are still a major uh, cause of death during the neonatal period. And if you look at the uh, current days after the neonatal period, you find that again pneumonia, AIDS, malaria, measles, diarrhea. So infection is still the major cause of death among children after five years old. And these are preventable in the sense that we have a vaccine for most of these conditions. That we are, we have vaccines for pneumococcal, rotavirus, hemophilus influenza, pertussis, measles, tetanus. And this vaccine has been around for some time. So we need to focus on getting the vaccine or getting children vaccinated. Okay. What about the vaccination schedule? You find that Malaysia has actually had uh, doing quite well okay, for a while in terms of the uh, vaccination schedule. Since the 1950s, we have this immunization program in Malaysia. Okay, and then uh, it was given free, and uh, we keep on adding and do it and supplement it and do revision. That and it's given through the hospitals, okay, government and private hospitals, but primary mostly are given through the health clinic, the KKM or and the maternal and child health clinics. Sometimes uh, uh, in the more uh, rural part of Sarawak, Sabah, there are actually mobile clinic uh, teams that goes in and then they visit the schools. So in terms, you know, you, you may be surprised to know that Malaysia is, is considered to have one of the best healthcare system in the world. Now you may not believe it, but take my word for it, it's true. Okay, and you find that we have we will be making revision and addition okay to the vaccination schedule as we go along okay we initial 
have BCG, and then we have oral polio, and then we are converted to uh, uh, immunized uh, IPV, uh, injectable polio vaccine. Okay, we have HPV. Okay, and then we hopefully, you know, uh, we hope to have a PCV or uh, pneumococcal vaccination. Okay, unfortunately, uh, we fought hard for it and it was about to be introduced into the Malaysian schedule this year. But it looks like it may be delayed for a few more years. So this is the schedule for th this moment. Okay, look at it and try to memorize it because you need to know that uh, we give uh, vaccination at birth, BCG and hepatitis B, then at one month hepatitis B, and then uh, DTAP, okay? Now, what is DTAP? Okay, you have diphtheria, tetanus, and AP. Okay, we know pertussis is P, or is A. Okay, go back and read up what is A, because it's important. Okay, one of the reasons why children, uh, parents fear bringing their uh, kids for vaccination was they have very high fever after the vaccine. But now with AP, okay, what is A? You have to find out for yourself. The incidence of children having fever is almost nil. So it's in a way quite safe. Okay. Now you find that uh, we used to have a measles vaccination at uh, in Sabah at nine months, then at 12 months is the for everybody or MMR or mom's measles rubella. But now, we, uh, a few years ago, the government has changed the schedule so that we have two doses of MMR. The reason being is that there was a recent upsurge of measles vaccine or with measles uh, cases in Malaysia. So now we have revised, there are two doses of it. And notice that at seven years, they have uh, measles and rubella. So you see that there's a variation, first and second dose, okay, and then a second dose uh, until 2023. After that, because we have two doses, we think that it's not necessary. Okay, Sabah, Sarawak, they actually have the six months, they have a single dose, then their first and second dose as us, and until 2023, the, uh, the MMR vaccine. How about Singapore? Now, Singapore schedule is almost the same as ours, except that they have, they're using oral polio instead of uh, uh, injection polio. Now, what is the difference between oral polio and the injectable polio? Okay, go back, read about it. Find out what's the difference? What's the danger of using oral polio and what is the danger of using IPV? Okay. Now, Singapore have this addition of pneumococcal vaccine already part of their schedule, which is something that we are fighting for now. The Australian schedule until 2013 was ro includes rotavirus. Okay, rotavirus is part of the Australian schedule and meningococcal at 12 months. Okay. And then after July uh, 2013, they have this vaccine called uh, MMRV, which is a combination. Because nowadays, we would, would like to combine vaccines so that the baby would get as little jabs as possible. So that's why we have the uh, six in one, hepatitis, diphtheria, tetanus, uh, well, you know what is A now, Pertussis, hemophilus influenza, a polio, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, the six in one. Okay, so now we have the six in one vaccine. And if you look at this, this is the American uh, schedule. It's actually the, almost the same like us. Now this is the schedule I give. This is a schedule that I would I use in my uh, clinic. You have to realize that Malaysia actually have a parallel healthcare system. 
Okay. You have the government side, and then you have the private side. Now, the government side is actually, you know, you can get a, a vaccination for free, and you can go and see the doctor and get three months of medicine for uh, $1 or $2 or $3. You can get an open heart surgery for $300. That is the public health, very heavily subsidized. Then you have the private sector, where the private hospitals, either through cash or through insurance, provide the same type of health care as the government as long as you're able to pay for it. Okay, so in the private healthcare, they have the services the same. We have primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. Okay. So in my clinic, I just tweak the uh, immunization schedule so that my, my philosophy is that not to try not to give more than one jab per visit. I think it's unfair to the baby to get two or three jabs at one go. So I'll see them at one month for the checkup, but no immunization. They would have uh, hepatitis B and uh, BCG at birth. Then at two months, I give them the six in one, okay? And the rotavirus. That means one injection and one oral. This is repeated at two, four, and six. At three months, they come for the pneumococca. First dose, second dose at five months, and the third dose at seven months. Then they get measles, they have chicken pox, okay, and chicken pox combined. So, so the schedule it basically is the same. I mean, the vaccines are the same, just slightly different timing. And in PIDs, we need to see the newborn every uh, month just to assess their development, their growth, and their health. So that is healthcare. Now, adults, we have uh, also immunization that are important. Okay, and then our coverage is actually in Malaysia is about more than 95%. Okay, and then uh, this is very good data. Okay, which is uh, more and all diseases are notifiable. Okay, so we just look through this, and this is a trend for polio and polio immunization in 1974 and the polio er eradication program. Unfortunately, we had our first case in uh, December 2019. Okay, and that is in Sabah. So for a long time, 27 years, we did not have any polio. We almost thought that we can claim success in the eradication of polio but the disease is not gone yet. So there is still work to be done. Whooping cough, okay, go back, read about, take time to read about whooping cough and what are the different types. And you find that the incidence of whooping cough, okay, because of the vaccination has almost gone down to almost zero. And then in the last few years, you see that there is a gradual uh, spike in in spite of the fact that acellular pertussis is introduced. Okay, that means it's safer, no fever, but yet the incidence has spiked. Why do you think that? Why do you think that the that, that, uh, incidence of uh, whooping cough has actually increased? Okay, we'll get to that later. Hepatitis, we find that, yes, with the introduction of the vaccine, the number of cases actually goes down, okay, which is good because we know that hepatitis lead on to uh, hepat hep B actually leads on to uh, liver disease and can liver cancer. So hopefully in the future, we'll see less and less cases of uh, liver cancer in Malaysia. We find that the case is almost zero in 2017, which is a good sign. And the other thing that is always asked is that, how about immunize re-immunization? Does the immunization uh, last forever for life. Now you see the hepatitis in this chart, it shows that the incidence actually of the antibodies measure actually goes down, goes down with time. But if there's an immuno challenge, if the patient is exposed to hepatitis B, 
which is usually through blood products, there is a increased response. Why? Because we have B cells, we have memory cells, and this responds to the vaccination. And you see that hepatitis B coverage is getting more, is better, and more and more widespread in the whole world. Now, measles is a challenge. You find that actually we were well on the way as usual of uh, you know, eradicating down the years and suddenly there is a peak again. You find that in 2010, we were quite happy. And then 2011, you find that the number of cases actually going up and up and up. Okay, rubella, German measles. Okay, read about this. This is important for you to know the signs, symptoms, and the complications. Rubella eradication, again, we were actually doing quite well. Okay, diphtheria, again, you can see that with the vaccination, the number of cases actually decrease. Okay, and uh, we will almost hardly see any case. Okay, and I wish that you would not see it in your lifetime. In your professional lifetime. Unfortunately, this is actually a, a real patient. The first case detected in November 2015 at the a pediatric institute where this child came in with severe sore throat and when you look inside you see that there is white pseudomembrane, there is swollen uh, vocal cords, swollen oropharynx and diphtheria is bad again. Smallpox, okay, you can read about it, but uh, we, the last uh, uh, person that's infected is this guy. Okay, hopefully we will not see smallpox again until, okay, let, okay until The other thing is tetanus. Hmm? Tetanus and human flu influenza. These are the and uh, meningitis, meningococcal meningitis. Okay, look and uh, read about this because these are very important for us to read. And strep pneumonia. Okay, strep pneumonia is a still a major complications, a major disease, and they are. Uh, it causes total diseases, mucosal disease, and invasive disease. Yeah, you find that the impact is actually quite severe. They can cause death, paralysis, mental retardation, seizure, learning disabilities, and hearing loss, and other things. The risk factor is here. And most children are very good colonizer. And you find that most of the straps are in the nose. So when they cough, when they talk, they can spread to each other and they can lead to sinusitis, pneumonia, bacteremia, and meningitis. So you find that strep is still a, con a, a problem here. Okay, My friend, uh, Dr. Tan Kaki, who is an infectious disease pediatrician, uh, was a state pediatrician of uh, Negri Simlan. I did a study on invasive pneumococcal disease among Malaysian children. Okay. And what is interesting is that you find that uh, in, in, he did the serotypes and you find that the pneumococcal vaccine, okay, initially they have vaccines number seven, that means seven serotype covered, and vaccine, uh, they improve it to 10, and now presently the vaccine is for 13. Uh, Prevena or uh, Nucleus is for 13 serotype and it covers about 78%, almost all. But more important is that it covers the important uh, serotypes. So that means vaccine can still, uh, can, will be 
effective in Malaysia. Okay, so he did the study among 13 hospitals. You can look at it, but uh, unfortunately, Sultana Amina is not among them. Okay, and the outcome is that at discharge, you know, 19% had died. Okay, and alive is 76%, and 13% have neurological deficit. So, Nimugoka is a problem. And now, and now the, the small number of the sample he has, half of them, 44%, needs ventilation support. Okay, so it is, there are limitations to the study. He admits that. That the mild cases are not captured. Uh, it's only government hospital. Okay, culture method and molecular studies are not available, but it is enough to show us that there is a problem. The significant mortality and morbidity. Okay, so we do need the vaccination. Okay, and we were actually quite happy that uh, the 15 years of struggle, this was during uh, October 2019. Okay, for years, the doctors in Malaysia, the Malaysian Pediatric Association especially, we have been asking the Ministry of Health to include uh, pneumococca in the vaccination schedule. Unfortunately, they did not respond until last year when they said, yes, we will do that. Okay, and that was before the coronavirus. So we don't know when this will happen. Now, I think it, we know that it is good. Vaccination, immunization is essential for newborns. But as doctors, we need to be able to address some of the concerns of parents. I think it's important for us to deal with parents as partners in our practice. Okay, because they are the stakeholders, it's their children. So we must get them on our side. And we will get them involved, convinced of the benefits. And what and parents do have questions. I think it's better that we answer them than for them to consult Dr. Google. Some of the common questions about vaccination is that do I need to vaccinate my child against diseases that aren't common anymore? Okay, something to think about. Are vaccines safe? Yeah. Does vaccines cause autism? Are preservative found in vaccines? Can my child get a disease from a vaccine? My child is allergic to eggs and our vaccine hala. So these are some of the things that you must be able to answer the parents when they ask you. Okay, and then just to skip over a few things that you can read on your own. And the other thing that you must know is that there is a group of parents that are against vaccination. We call them the anti-vax. Okay. The anti-vaccination movement is a growing movement. And I think that uh, by the time you get to practice, there will be a formidable force. Okay. It usually starts as initially very small movements, but in Malaysia, we are collecting data and we find that there are more and more and more parents involved. And you find that different states, the vaccine refuser. So there are different ways we try to get them. Uh, they are using the social media, the internet, okay, uh, very actively. And you find that what are the some of the reasons why they refuse? I feel that homeopathy will be a uh, issue, halal haram, whether uh, vaccination is uh, haram or not, internet influence, content, family influence, adverse event, okay, the fee, how much it costs, it is free in government. Other reasons, traditional medicine, okay, have a look at this chart and see what are the reasons why they refuse and when they refuse. So there is a number of reasons why. And 
we need to have some programs to counteract this before they become more and more support and more and more people refuse. Okay, you say that. What are some of the ways we can discuss that? But lastly, I just want to comment on the cold chain. You find that vaccines are manufactured under very stringent condition. They are sent to distributors, and we hope that the distributor keep them in very stringent condition, and they send to us at the provider's office. Okay, before we give it to the children. Okay. It's so important to keep the vaccine in a stable and optimum condition from the manufacturer to our clinic. Because if you, especially you're dealing with live vaccine and the virus dies because of this, it, it's not stored in optimum conditions. And basically you're giving them sugar water. Okay, so must be the optimum condition and you look at the wow and you see uh, cloudy at the bottom, that means there is something wrong with the vaccine. So you might see that, yes, uh, you, most GP clinics use the ordinary fridge to store the vaccine, which uh, is not ideal, but best, I mean, the best you can do. But if you want to store your vaccine in the ordinary fridge, please do not use a fridge to store your lunch or your cold your drinks because keep it as a, a vaccine fridge and do not open because every time you open and close, the temperature differs. You find that vaccines store, the live vaccine are stored in the freezer. Okay, and the other vaccines are stored in the lower compartments. So please do not propose it to light and to heat okay, and maintain the temperature. Okay. Ideally, you should have uh, this, this uh, vaccine uh, fridge, which is the one that I have in my clinic. Okay. This vaccine fridge has its own Wi-Fi. So anytime the temperature goes down below a certain level, an alarm will, uh, will ring in the main, uh, uh, main pharmacy. And the pharmacies have to come out and check the vaccine. And then, by the way, we also have a backup generator for this. So in case of a power failure. So yeah, that is it. But this is very expensive. Costs about $15,000. Okay, you can get this for about $500. But I think it's important. Now I'm going to stop here. And I'm not going to talk about dengue uh vaccine and all these things because uh we can we can uh, discuss that later okay we will have leave time for discussion here